What is up, everyone? Once again, welcome to another uh, Tuesday night session. So for today's topic, we're going to be talking about how to handle choppy days. I know a lot of people, and I start every single class like this, a lot of people honestly don't know how to handle the topics that I put in for each of these classes, how to work their way around them, how to make it work better in their uh, personal environment for when they trade, whether they're a day trader, a scalper, or a swing trader, or maybe even like a year plus with shares they want to hold. Understanding the choppy days as a day trader or even being a swing trader trying to find new positions, you really have to understand what you're looking for and how to avoid the days that is going to basically lower all values for uh, all premiums, all contracts that may not be worth the headache of trying to hold through just like that up-down momentum with the stock market. I know today it's kind of crazy how every topic that I have already prepared, the market has the same exact effect of what the title is. Last week, we had uh, the idea of how to let runners run, and the market had a massive uh, directional day. And then today, straight chop day, same as yesterday as well. So it's good that you guys are seeing these things happen before the classes actually uh, so, like, start to be talked about the topic. So you understand, like, okay, I'm going into this class. The market was exactly what we're talking about. So I can understand maybe why not trading today was a successful day for some people. You don't have to trade every single day in the market. You don't have to actually make money every day to be successful. When you don't trade, and I love telling people this, you have the same amount of money that you had the day today going into tomorrow. It's like a reset button. If you trade a day, you make money not understanding why you made money, or you end up losing money today, you go into tomorrow with like a mindset of, okay, I have to make back what I lost. But if you had a winning day, not really understanding why you took the trade, you're going to try and repeat the same cycle or the same entry point based off the chart setup, not comprehending you possibly got lucky with the game. So knowing how to distinguish directional days, choppy days in the entire market, whether it's individual stocks or just like the S&P or the SPY, it plays a huge effect in the how to preserve your money long-term and actually make an impact on growth moving forward, understanding when you shouldn't make a trade, and most importantly, understanding how to make a trade based off a system and not just entering because you're bored or you want to get a trade in before uh, 4 p.m. Eastern hits. So as we talk about this, uh, I take the bullet points with every uh, section and just briefly break it down to you guys, answer questions in between. Maybe if you guys feel a certain way about a topic or what I say, you can just type it in the chat and I can react to it and get some involvement. But the realization you don't have to trade every day. People act like they have to make a trade to be successful. And that's totally understandable. A lot of social media nowadays from a retail perspective wise, showing the profits on the day is like, the egotistic thing that people do. Not many people explain how they made the money they did or explain, like, I entered because of this reason. While I was in the trade, this happened with the position I was in. It's very misdirection, misdirection with people that post, and then you see it thinking, oh, they're green every day, green every day. Not many people confront both sides of a trader's perspective. Losses, the emotional side, the confidence side because of a solid setup that they, that they had in mind they saw. You don't have to trade every single day. And I'm like, I'm going to keep repeating this. I always say this even before this specific class came into mind, because when I first started, I was always focused on like, I have X amount of buying power left. I haven't made a trade. It's already 2 p.m. Eastern. I want to throw money in the market. Even if I lose, I just want to act like I did something today. And I'm sure a lot of people have had the same, like, not environment, but like the reaction to the market. You haven't made a trade all day. It's already, let's just say 11 a.m. Eastern or three to four hours into the market. You just want to throw money in so you did something. Not even like caring, oh, I'll, I, I may lose, I may win. You just want to throw money in. So I try and get that idea across to people. If you have a system that you wait for a specific setup, you know what not to do, what to do. You don't need to force things out of boredom or out of the fact of, if I just sit here all day, and I don't make any trade, it's not successful for me as a person. I don't feel accomplished today. The biggest relationship with being a stock trader or any type of like your own boss for a, a company, your own entrepreneurship you're pursuing, you can't relate it to like a basic nine to five job or a corporate job that you had to clock in and clock out. 
you have duties every day when you clock in. As a trader, your duty is not just to throw money in, whether it's a chop market, a directional day, you wait for something that you are familiar with that you know has low risk, high reward, and you need to put that into your perspective to make the long term possible for you. I try and like break that down to people. You clock into a job, imagine sitting there and not being productive all day. Yes, you're going to be paid, but how would your boss feel about that? You being your own boss as a trader gives you the freedom, gives you the chances to make your own decisions in the moment. Do I want to trade? Is this going to be an effective day to trade when the market's not moving as much? If you can recognize that, you may even be able to just walk away for the day and not put yourself into the position of FOMO possibilities or just pulling the trigger on a trade that you know you should not be doing. So understanding that, it's very irritating for a lot of people. And for me, when I first started, I always thought like I have to trade today. I make one trade, I still have X amount of buying power. I have to throw money back in the market because if I don't, it's like I still have money left over. I didn't actually like complete the day from my personal preference at that time. And as I grew, as I lost money, which everyone loses money in the market, I figured out the biggest losses I would have was either A, trading the system I was not familiar with. I didn't understand the risk to reward. And eventually it would just catch up to me on the losing side compared to the wins I had with it. But then I actually like sat down and thought about why am I trading if I don't like what I see? Or why am I trading if I know the market's barely moving? I'm just trying to get in and get out. Why am I putting myself in that position? I'd rather preserve my money and come back a day or two later, maybe even a week, as long as it may take. The fact that you can keep the same amount of money you had is going to have you in a better position a week from now. Instead of like being down 100 bucks today, 200 bucks tomorrow, you make back 300 the next day. The day after that, you lose another hundred dollars. All of that intermediate of small loss, big win, big loss, small win. You're at the same spot from where you were before taking those like naive trades, I like to say. So the realization of like a successful day to me, if you have a system, you have a plan, chop day or not chop day, you follow it and you respect the rules that you know you have to follow. Because if you enter a trade based off a system, and say you lose, are you actually losing? Like the idea is yes, you're losing, it's a red trade, I lost money, but think about what you learned from following a system that did not work out versus entering off a trade that you think, oh, this could be the big one, I'm just gonna enter because I'm bored. What are you really learning from a mistake like that compared to following a system and then you understanding the possible risk and the upside of the trade in the same sequence? So as you understand chop days, people start to realize like at some point price action has to move. So why are you forcing trades knowing like everyone forces trades out of the idea of something big is going to happen? Oh, it has to be today that this breaks out. Eventually a move happens. And so many people, including myself, I'm very big on like self-experience with uh, life and just trading. I've blown portfolios in the past right before a massive day in the market. And I'm talking like Apple moves five to six points in a day. Uh, the S&P moves 50 to 80 points in a day. SPY moves eight plus points in a day. I've been in those same situations. And then you sit there and you just regret what you did. Knowing in the moment, oh, I don't care. I just want to put money in the market. But once you see those big moves happen and you're not financially prepared and even mentally prepared, you're sitting there wishing you never did what you uh, did a few days ago or maybe the day before, weeks before. It eats you alive when people like don't comprehend that. Preserving money over making money. That's one of my favorite things to say, to say now. So knowing chop days, knowing how to pick and choose, okay, do I really want to enter here? You need to handle that with precision and patience because everyone here wants to make money. I know everyone that is listening right now is here because they want to learn how to grow. They want to learn the secrets there's no secrets with anything. You just have to know who you are. What exactly do you want to achieve? What exactly do you have to do to achieve? Journaling comes into play. Understanding your personality as a trader. Talking, hearing all this stuff can be boring for someone, but for the ones that know what they need to grow, they're here just listening. They understand, like, I have this, like, 90% of what I do, I know how I'm doing it, but this 10% is why I keep losing over and over. I need to find, like, what that 10% is for me to 
like get to that point of a successful, consistent winning strategy, understanding right from wrong, knowing where to go when I'm lost right now. And as I tell you guys this stuff, some hear it and it goes out the other ear or some take this in and they start to watch the market. Like, okay, today's a chop day. I'm going to sit here and just not do anything. Because once the move happens, I don't think many people understand what like a massive move really means when the market has one of those. Have you seen consolidation for a few days, if not weeks or even a month straight? I think it was back in February or March, the S&P was zoning for almost a month and a half straight. And once we broke out, we ran 100 uh, plus points, like not in a day, but like back to back to back. 30 points, 40 points, 20 points, all upside. Once that break happens, that's when you start pulling the trigger. You don't want to just try and catch the move beforehand because you never know when it's going to happen. You can play the move and wait for the recontest or wait for the actual move to happen because it's going to be consecutive, back-to-back days. It's not like you're missing it. You just have to be prepared financially and mentally for when that day does present itself. Price action squeezes and that's why that reaction happens when it's just chopping up, down, up, down. There's no momentum. Why are you playing that? So like being able to distinguish today, I know I shouldn't trade. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't ever feel like I didn't trade today. This is a horrible day for me. Like I, I at least want to make 50 bucks. I want to do something. Wait for a proper setup. Don't just throw money in. Oh, we're about to break out to the upside. I have to get calls because if it goes, I don't want to sit here and then just think I missed it. The minute you enter calls, possibly the position goes down in the red. You sell for a small loss and it pushes right back to break even. Like the whole psychology factor of trading, knowing the mindset before just how to make money, that's what's going to keep you from losing the money after you make it. And you'll know how to grow it. You'll know how to avoid certain markets. And using just not even chop days, I don't think many people also don't like realize Just because the overall market is choppy, it's not moving good, it's red on the day, there is always strength somewhere in the market, whether it's a sector, whether it's a specific stock, maybe banks are hot. So Bank of America, JP Morgan, uh, Visa, payment processing apps, you start to realize from a different perspective, okay, maybe I'm looking at stuff that isn't hot on the day, I need to branch out and find other things that Maybe when my watch list is red, there's other stocks I can start to like adventure into, figure out how they move and use that to my advantage on the bad days. A lot of people may only watch, let's just say, uh, like, let's say Amazon and Apple. People just watch those two stocks. If they're both red on the day and they're thinking in their head, like, I want calls, like the overall market's green. Why are these two stocks going down? Figure out what is hot in the market. Like, what is the reason? as to why it's pushing upside, but the stocks you watch may not be moving. Maybe it's the financial sector. Maybe it's real estate. Maybe it's industrial sector. You find other strengths when your main go-to is weak on the day. And if you don't want to put yourself in that position to find something different, you don't trade. And guess what? You comprehending, I should not trade today. The fact that you're not making money is not a big deal. It's that you're saving money you could be losing. Like really process that. You're here to make money in the market, and I get that. But how are you going to keep money if you don't know how you're making it? You get a lucky trade, it's gone. You hit big on a breakout day, and then it starts to chop, and you start throwing money in thinking, I made a 1000 last week. I made no trades, and it's already Thursday of this week. I got to at least get 500 on the week. So you force trades. And then as you trade, sell for a loss, sell for a small win, that mental capacity of like the market's so bad, why am I putting money in you're putting yourself in a position to not really think about the good side. You just want to make money. You're looking at like the reward before the journey of how to get there. Like what's the setup that you're focused on? Should you even be trading the market right now when it's not what you need? So like some sectors, they will give you good moves compared to the list that you guys tend to watch. Maybe I know some people, all they watch is spy the QQQ and maybe like the S&P and like other main indices, but they don't watch actual stocks within those. Just because let's say uh, the QQQ is red on the day, Meta, or maybe even Apple, they can be green on the day, even though the sector that they're within, the indice they're in is going the other way. There's always strength somewhere in these pack of stocks. 
And a lot of people don't look into stuff like that. They don't comprehend, oh, well, if this stuff is not good, something else has to be a lot better. And that's when you can use like the heat map on Finviz. You can use other resources, maybe a watch list that you personally have that only show the sectors in the market. So you know like what's green and what's red on the day. What should I avoid with calls? What should I avoid with puts? So knowing that gives you a broader perspective to comprehend, okay, this is what I have to do because it's going to make me survive in this market. If I don't follow this stuff, it could put me in a position to lose money. And then after you sell for that loss, you're sitting there thinking, I never should have traded today. I never should have put myself in this situation. And I'm hoping I'm like, maybe going through to some of you and you're starting to realize like I traded this week when I never should have. I'm down on the week because I did trades that at this point, I know I should have never done. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you learn from that mistake, journaling is so important and it, it's time consuming. It can be annoying for some people. And for me, I never wanted to do it in the beginning only because why do I want to document a winning trade? Like I made money. I'm going to close my computer. I'll be back tomorrow. What did I do to make money though? Like what was the outcome? Okay, I made money, but what was it that like got me to that outcome? Why did I enter? Was I down on the trade, but I held because the chart was showing strength? Was there a support zone on my call entry? And that's why I didn't sell for a loss at the moment. You have to break down the process of getting to that end result, whether red or green, you have to find positives, you have to find negatives. So going off of the choppy zones, as these zones get tight, I'm not talking like the S&P today where we were like up and down about what, eight to 10 points a few times, but end of the day, we were zoning between the 45.85 and the 45.80 area, 45.80, 45.75. Uh, For almost a whole hour, we're just moving five points. Maybe don't watch that specific indice. Maybe switch over to like an actual stock, maybe Apple, Amazon, Tesla, find something that's moving to maybe draw your attention away from forcing a position into something that's not giving you a positive outlook. And it's very, uh, very hard to kind of take your focus away from what you only are accustomed to, but that will restrict you from forcing entries knowing you shouldn't do that. And it sucks. Like I get it. I've lost money taking a trade. And then when I sell, I look at the chart. I'm like, why did I even enter this? It was not even logically smart. Now I'm red on the day. At that point, it's like, I want to trade again to get, at least get back to break even. Try and get back what I lost. Not realizing you're just digging yourself a hole. And as you dig, you can't get out of it. So walking away, knowing when to accept the results. And you don't ever want to rush into a position because you're more than likely going to lose money. And if you do make money on a position that you rushed into, what are the chances that you're going to keep that money moving forward? So as we break down, like me talking and you guys listen to what I've been saying, I want to pull up a few charts and just show you guys how to catch these things, how to know when to avoid certain setups, how to understand the process of like, I can't do this. I have to find a new way to make it work. And I'm pretty sure you guys still see the document, if I'm not mistaken. So let me switch over to Weeble. Let me know if you guys see my Weeble screen. Uh, Christopher said, can you go over the different sectors? It definitely helps us gauge uh, market sediment. What um, helps you? Okay, yeah, you say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What helps you gain confidence in whether to take a spot, XPX trade, for example? All right, Christopher. So uh, I'm going to reread your question one more time once I pull up the S&P. And if you don't mind, do you care if I use the SPY for correlation? I, I get there are different prices, but the charts are the identical. I just like how people can see the pre-market and after hours. Is that fine with you? If not, I can do SPX. I just want your like yes or no since you asked the question. Whatever is best to make your point. Okay, that's perfect. So I'm going to use SPY just because pre-market and after hours, it's easier to gauge. People watch SPY, I feel like, more than the S&P if they have a small account. So I'm going to do this just so you guys can basically see more candles from that 4 a.m. Eastern to 8 p.m. Eastern, like pre-market and after hours. So just to reread your question for everyone, can you go over the different sectors? It definitely helps us gauge market sediment. What helps you gain confidence in whether to take an SPX trade, for example? So the first thing that I do every morning, and this is obviously before I do anything, I have a specific watch list that I pull up where I have 
like the main cryptos, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I have like the US dollar, Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, the S&P, QQ, Uranium, the VIX, and then the actual sectors for the market, which you'll find on ThinViz for the heat map. In pre-market, I'm looking to see what's hot before the market even opens. Like what sector is already booming in pre-market? Is it technology sector? Maybe it's industrial. Maybe it's just a consumer discrete. So I'm looking to see, okay, what sector is hot? Now, what stocks are within these sectors? I know just from so much studying I've done, what stocks are in each sector, like the biggest ones that hold the highest percent of the indice. But it's good for you guys to comprehend, like, what am I really looking for? If uh, tech is red on the day, like tech sector, knowing what is the main sector or the main stock within that sector gives you that edge. Knowing Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, knowing those are in the top, check to see what they're doing. If they're green and the sector's red, possibly those stocks could pull back to red or the actual uh, sector of tech could push to the upside. So you want to find like those misbalances within the market. And before I answer the question about like you said, uh, what helps you gain confidence to take a trade? I just want to show you guys like how I find these zones to avoid trading. I never force entry based off the one minute time frame for the day of for a stock. Because if we look at the one minute for SPY, it's kind of like, oh, you could have caught the area up here. You could have caught the top, play puts the downside. You could have caught calls intraday where this double bottom happened, wrote it to the upside. I'm always looking at the zones on the bigger perspective. I'm not talking the daily, the weekly, but just enough to see the zones that's been happening in the historical few days with price action. So for me using SPY, the 30 minute, I can see a good amount. If I go down to the 15 minute, I can still see all that I need. All the price action underneath uh, 451.5, all of this white highlight, I am not interested in right now. Obviously I have levels that date back to like 2022, 2021 on the SPY. So that's what all these levels represent. But looking at just what you see on the screen right now, where are the main zones? Like where is the chop? over the last few days. At the first starting point of comprehending this, we got a main high and we have a main low in this area. And I'll uh, color correlate these just so that they're the same. So the two oranges, we have the high and the low in the zone. The low has already shown strength on a dip to that area. So we know, okay, we had a double bottom at the low. So we know the strength is there for the upside. As we hit the upside, price action is lowering. I am not interested in playing calls unless we push down to the bottom, which is around the 451.5 area on SPY. Then obviously, if we're pushing upside, why do I want to get calls if we're contesting 459.5, which was the highest in this zone? The majority of the consolidation is roughly around the middle area where we like break above, we pull back. We break above, we pull back, but we can't hold above 456.5 on SPY. So knowing the bigger picture, I consider all of this chop the past three days, three trading days, since it was Friday, Monday, Tuesday. All of this is, if you scalp, that's your type of system. But if you're looking for like the move, the breakout, the actual continuation for one direction, what are you really going to focus on or look for when you see this on a bigger frame? Because all I see right here is like, if you miss the top of here, and you're trying to chase puts before it's too late, the bigger picture, it's zoning right in the center between the 459.5 and the 451.5. It's in the dead center of this. So it's zoning, it's choppy. Do I want to put myself in a position to trade what I know is basically where it's very indecisive in the middle? If we're pushing upside and we're slowly starting to make like rejection, rejection, getting puts at the top of the zone is the lowest risk, highest reward. For a lot of retail, and I say this based off my personal past that I would also struggle with, they want to get calls on the contest for the high, not waiting for a possible breakout above this level, and then it recontests to hold as support. This is the proper entry for calls, that recontest and it holds as support. Many people, they see this push upside. Like say Spider, they would have just broke up. We're just chopping, chopping. No one's buying calls. And then finally, end of the day, it's like, oh, we're about to send end of the day. I have to get calls before it's too late. That's when I always tell people, like, zoom out and realize you're buying the top. 
So you're basically hoping that volume buying pressure keeps coming in. The breakout happens and the continuation keeps pushing even higher. And you don't really see the bigger picture because when you're in the moment, you're looking at the smaller time frame. All you see is green candle, bullish trends are holding. Are you really entering based off a system? Or do you like, do you comprehend like, oh, this is like a chop zone. We're still in the chop and we could reject you. I don't want to get calls right now. Or are you just buying because, oh, I'm on the one minute, the two minute, we're making straight upside. I got to get in before it's too late. So that's what I'm always focused on. The confidence of the bigger picture. I trust the bigger picture and I let that guide me into what I buy, what I sell, when I sell for a game, when I sell for a loss. Right now where SPY has been, and I'm sure a lot of you in uh, Rippy Global have noticed, I have not been talking very much. I haven't been alerting. I'm not going to force trades for people when I'm questioning what I want to do. And I understand people pay for the service, but you also have to realize you are paying to learn how to keep money and grow it. Not just make money every day following people, but we're, I'm hoping I can teach you guys to be self-efficient, to comprehend the fact of, okay, this person entered this trade, but why did they enter specifically? I want you guys to be able to figure that out so that you can like do your own DD before entering a position or following someone. Because when you understand why someone enters a position, they will comprehend, well, you will comprehend why they do and if you don't, that's when you can ask questions. Get their side of things to learn in the process. So then going off the reversal rule, the vice versa of getting like puts at the bottom, as we're selling off after hours, I'm not focused on like, oh, we're going to sell off like the downside is coming. I know we have a massive support still in the same chop zone, but the very bottom at 451.5 area, that's a logical bounce. And if we don't bounce there, a dollar and fifty cents below, we have another level at four hundred and fifty dollars a share for SPY. As SPY pulls back, notice all these bounces we had when it tried to pull back to that four fifty one point five. And we're currently going to open up around that area tomorrow if we don't have like that overnight push. So when I see chop on the bigger picture, that's what gives me conviction, the confidence to like, okay, I gotta wait. Or maybe, okay, puts here looks good because we have not been able to break above that level with buying pressure. The selling pressure is heavier. I'm going to put my faith in the chart with a low risk, high reward setup, maybe even enter light and not just full port. Like a lot of people, they see a breakout, they full port calls, then it pulls back 20% and they have to sell because they're freaking out that they're going to lose like a majority of their portfolio. I always use levels and I trust the chart. So now going off uh, the first part of your question, the different sectors. So just looking at the two main ones that I want to show you guys, the energy and technology sector, or maybe it was communications today. Let me see which one before I get in. Yeah, so technology. So energy and technology sector. If I go to the four hour time frame, we talked about this in the charting uh, this past week. We're slowly breaking out on the upside and we're holding the trends of higher highs, higher lows. Now we're starting to push to where we've rejected before. So the bigger picture shows that if we can break above and hold this area, we're going to have continuation to keep pushing to the upside for the energy sector. When I switch to the daily time frame, I'm going to hide all these lines. You see the momentum. A lot of the time when I'm looking at sectors, I want to see, like, is there momentum? Is it chopping? Is there a downtrend? Energy is having that push. So as energy moves up, I'm trying to figure out, okay, tech was the last hot sector, like AMD was running, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, Apple, they've all been running. So if tech is slowly pulling back, where could that money that they're selling those shares out of be going into next? More than likely, it's not going to be the same sector. So I'm trying to find the next possible breakout from a sector overall, not like an individual stock, like within energy, obviously XOM, Chevron, you have those other stocks to look at but I wanna see what the actual sector is doing. If I switch to the financial sector, we're at a zone where we usually reject. We push up, we have rejections. So as tech is at this area and we're trying to pull back, or they're trying to hold the strength as well, looking at the setup, if I switch to the four hour, we're trying to get a little cup and handle going on this setup, which is still bullish. We rejected the brim of the breakout, now we're trying to get that buying pressure to curl this and send it higher as we move to the upside. The understanding of the sector's holding trends, we still have not broken the previous higher low on this setup. So until we break this level here on technology or the financial sector, 
finances are still hot with energy. They're still pushing upside. Energy and finance is still going to look good. And uh, I think you guys have noticed, I've been saying, like, as tech slows down, money, usually for the rotation, goes in the finances, energy, and usually real estate. So the fact that we're showing that continuation, we have the uptrends on finance, we switch over to uh, technology and communications now, we're at all-time highs for these sectors. The breakouts happen for these. Energy and finance, they're around this area right now, trying to get that momentum. So as we see tech possibly slow down, obviously like right now it's chopping. Tech has been chopped for almost a week to a week and a half straight after it broke the high, it's kind of just like up, down, up, down. No continuation, no like direction is going at the moment. It's trying to hold. We have Apple and Amazon earnings on Thursday. So that could play into effect as to what happens with technology. As I move down to communication sector, this is not at all time highs, but look how much it's ran since the breakout of this heavy rejection that it usually had. Massive push. So comparing the ideas of how the sectors are uh, aligning, energy is pushing all time highs. The finance is trying to break out it's also consolidating at the moment, the same as tech. So using these sectors, as they pull back, as they push higher, look at the stocks within those and see if they're following suit with the sector they're in. That's one of the biggest things that I try and do with myself when I look at pre-market or even like intraday around lunch hours. Some sectors sell off while others push. So around lunch hours, when I'm looking for like an end of the day play or maybe a swing overnight, I'm seeing what sector is pushing heavier than the other ones and I check what stocks within them are given that direction instead of just looking at a chop market like the S&P today or SPY today. It was just straight up down. So I was trying to find different things to look at or maybe give that edge of what could be moving good, moving forward. And I saw uh, Vic just said, can you go over your thought process on your swings today? So uh, the MU, which is Micron, I entered this based off the AMD, and the reasoning behind why I entered MU, and I will, I need the four hour, I think. Yes. So currently we broke above this rejection level that I've been eyeing for a while now. And we're currently trying to base on that and hold. So I'm looking for that curl based off MU. I'm looking to see if buying pressure can keep holding it. We've had this rejection happen multiple times. And when we have broken above, we pull right back under. But that $70.50 area around here has always been like that rejection. So now that we've broken above and we're kind of just holding this three days back to back after the breakout, I was anticipating AMD to have good earnings, possibly for Micron to have a push overnight with that. And as of right now, they are down 0.44%. But I'm looking for that continuation or at least for it to hold this support now. It broke the resistance. Now it should act as a, a support zone. And that's why I told you guys I'm sizing light. I just have a few contracts. I'm going to swing these. If we catch momentum and chip stocks have that volume surge or whatever you want to call it, the setup for Micron is already prepared for that resistance to support flip to hold this level. So I'm basically entering off the chart. It's not really like, oh, I trust this. I think this is going to be huge. I see the chart, the rejection we used to have. We're holding that for three days back to back. I expect buyers to show some strength here. Maybe I should have added a week or so of time to that position, but I feel pretty good with what we're sitting at right now. And looking at the daily candle, which I don't like how Weeble has that happen. We had a lot of buying pressure on that drop off and we almost closed that candle green. And I'm looking to see if we can continue the upside push at least up to 7150. I'm not expecting like a $72 a share push, but getting the contract in the money and letting it hold its value as the support at 70.5 holds will give us that idea of this could happen. And yeah, Chris, I saw the downgrade and everything, the AAA down to AA plus. So we'll see if that's a scare tactic for retail. We'll see if it's legit and we'll see what all aligns. And then uh, Bank of America, I'll go over that as well. Finance was looking good today for the overall sector. And I was looking at Bank of America for an entry on this recon test. So I wanted to wait until about $31 a share for the actual resistance to support flip. But I decided to get in a little bit sooner based off not just the recent chop that BAC had, where this white highlight is, 
but more so the resistance that kept holding above that $31 a share. We had a lot of pullbacks, a lot of areas that held around like the 31.4, 31.2 area. And using this pullback with the uh, falling wedge, I got us in at basically the bottom of this area, hoping for like that curl. Because I know all we need for this, with this being two extra weeks of time, the finance is still holding well. I don't know if banks are buying up their own shares or hedge funds are doing it, but finances didn't really pull back as heavy after the earnings that we just had where a few banks weren't as good as expected. So with this strength still holding, I'm expecting a slight push to the upside to at least around $32 a share, which obviously 50 cent push on uh, Bank of America is not massive, but for the uh, contracts, it will be enough to put them in green, if not maybe 30, 40% to get that nice trim on the contract. So as long as we can hold this lower lows, this uh, falling wedge I'm trusting based off the support around $31 a share to $31.50 area, and I'm letting this chart play out basically. Just like every position I usually enter, I'm not entering based off my ego saying, oh, this is the setup, I'm, I, I trust this, I know I'm gonna be right. I'm entering off the chart and I'm just letting the chart do the work for me. I'm never expecting just to win every single trade. I hope for it obviously, but I only prepare for the possible reaction to the downside with every position I entered. So knowing my risk, I need 31 to hold, around 31.50 is like the support zone that I like. I like the entry right now off this bottom of this wedge. We could push overnight into a uh, pre-market tomorrow, but just like Chris uh, typing in the chat, we had a downgrade. Yellen was trying to say, like it's not as big of an issue as it is. So things could happen overnight. It could be a scare tactic, news for retail to sell off just from the buy up to dip again. So we'll see how tomorrow presents itself. So going into uh, the last part of everything I wanna talk about, I'm gonna move back over to SPY. And I want you guys to, if you have any questions, anything you want me to repeat possibly before I show you more about avoiding chop zones, how to actually determine where they are, how to in, like find out, uh, inside day trading, outside day trading. Is there any specific question you guys may have at all? Uh, it was a Q, QCOM missed up move on Friday. So I'm gonna have to look at that and see what it did. And if you guys may not have any questions, I can just talk about the last thing that I wanted to visually show you. Cause I, uh, does anyone, like, do you guys understand how to determine like a chop market compared to just, oh, this is continuation. This is a breakout. Do you know like inside days to outside day trading? If you want you to say like, yes, I understand. No, I don't understand. Chop market is like a lot of words. So chop market is just like consolidations. Like the market's not moving anywhere. Kind of like what we've been in for the past, what has this been since? july 19th so almost two weeks we've just been going up down up down we're, we're in a zone we're chopping there's no like continuation like what happened no move this highlight there's no continuation like what happened after this broke out like spy broke out in this area after rejecting that top a few times we pulled back rejected again pulled back this breakout is like the move out of the chop zone uh, can you explain it, please? Nobody understands. Okay, so like inside day trading, uh, chop chop markets, you have to distinguish like when do I want to play calls? When do I want to play continuation and hold overnight? You have to comprehend when main levels break, so you know once this level breaks and it holds above, buyers are going to step in. The algorithms for Wall Street, for the computers, for hedge funds, they buy in based off level breaks and they put their volume of the heavy money into the market to push it higher. They know what to look for, it's all pre-planned. This right here, going back to April to basically the start of June, all this right here is considered chop. There's no clear direction, there's moves in between, but think about some of these days like right here where the market was moving maybe for SPY, not even a dollar upside and downside for a few days back to back. 23 levels suck. So a lot of the time levels are formed off price action. So don't, I mean, don't say like, what if they suck? You have to learn at some point. Everyone, when they first start trading, everyone, I don't want to say sucks, but they don't know much. So you learn as you chart, you understand how to put stuff into play. You learn 
the different side of trading that no one really shows you on social media and what you like see from their perspective, making big money. Oh, it's this easy. It's not as easy as people make it seem. So understanding when not to trade, when to trade, that's the stuff people need to look for. So understanding if I put a level around this area, as we push above this highlight zone, people want to see a break and hold. So it breaks above this consolidation. If I switch to the daily, and I'm going to put some vertical lines in here real quick, just so you guys can see where this is at when I go to the daily time frame. So looking at these daily candles, there's not much movement. Everything happens overnight. There's a few moves like intraday, but so many retail, when they focus on the highs and the lows of whether it's just like a zone, chop, heavy resistance, heavy support, they want to play the move after it breaks on the upside or the downside. They're not focused on, oh, like we're at the downside here. I should get calls because it could bounce. They're only focused on, oh, it broke finally. We're outside. I got to get in before it's too late. So looking at the chop between these two areas, the orange and the red, this is all stuck in between for multiple days. As levels break on the downside, people chase it. They buy the puts, oh, we're, we're outside day trading. We're outside the zone. There's no break and hold. There's no strength showing you that this is going to continue on the downside or the upside. When looking back a few extra days, we can see buying pressure hit around here. Wicks down, picks it up from buyers. Wicks above, sellers hit it, pulls it back down. When it tries to break above, notice the shooting star of just straight selling pressure on the breakout. So we know anywhere in this area, it's hesitant. The zone and price action is going to basically fight with buyers and sellers. Once we broke underneath the same zone a few months later, it got bought right up off of buying pressure. So understanding what's the break and hold I'm looking for for that continuation move. A lot of people see a breakout like right here. Green candle out. We had two candles closed on the daily. There's no strength pushing it higher. Basically, a double top on the two daily candles right here. Send the price action right back inside the zone. When people see a break inside the zone, it's like, oh, we're back inside a chop day. You have to look to see, is buying pressure picking up? What's going to happen with the actual chart now? So pulling up the volume, notice you can use these. It's not always accurate, but you can see how much volume is heavier on the daily, the four hour, the two hour, by using the volume candles. Understanding when the candles come down, buyers pick it up. When it's holding at the top, there's not as many buyers, but price action's holding. So using these to understand possibly give you an edge. Knowing when volume is heavy on the day, when it's light on the day, what the candlestick did with the volume coming in, it's very important to try and use that to your advantage. And as the move happens, is volume increasing? Is it dying down? What's happening with the move? If you guys are looking at like the breakout that happened, we pulled out of the like the inside day trading of that small zone, pulled right back inside, but it did not hold. So as you see price action break back above, you should be looking for a possible long position based off the buying strength holding the price above the historical rejection zone that it could not break out of. It showed like promising results of like, oh, the candles above it pulled back in. Once those candles hold, watch how the move breaks out once price gets determined and it finds that strength one direction or the other. SPY sat in this range for almost roughly a month and a half straight. There's moves in between, you could have caught stuff. But once the breakout happened, pulled back inside with literally almost a $10 drop in three days, just to push back up almost $15 in four days. So once the move happens on the like consolidation break, that's when you need to start preparing for an entry point. Because once the breakout happened and it held, I'm gonna switch to the four hours just so you can see the pre-market and after hours. Once this broke out, Look at the move that happened. Within two days back to back of catching the recontest, I like to call it, the resistance broke, catch the support pullback. Look at the wicks on this pullback. As these wicks pull back, you can start to size in because we're holding outside of the intraday trading. We're recontesting the rejection area roughly and holding it as a support, giving it the market strength, using that to your advantage, watching how the volume increases on these dip buys, using that. Within two days, the SPY jumped literally almost 15 points in two days. You could have not traded for I don't know how many weeks and made almost all the money you would have made 
scalping in between all these days, probably giving yourself a headache, not knowing what to look for exactly. And then once that move breaks out, consolidates again, price actions holding a new support, you know sellers aren't going to hit. The next move comes out, and that's when it actually hits with whether it's retail chasing, institution buying shares more. That's when the breakout happens. If you miss the breakout, watch for the pullback. There's always going to be selling pressure after a massive run, and that's currently where we're at right now. We had the chop of this double top, unable to break out with buying pressure. The higher lows come into play, price action's rising, not pulling back as heavy. Once price action squeezes, it only has one way to go, up or down. So understanding the possibilities with the breakout, as this broke out to the upside, SPY had that run again. From the breakout to the actual tap out area, it was roughly an $18 move from the low to the high. And of course it chops, it chops, and now we're back inside a chop zone. The same situation, I'm gonna highlight these in color just so you guys can see them better. Same chop here. We have sell-offs, we have massive pushes, we have sell-offs again, but we're still chopping in the overall zone. So understanding, okay, we're chopping. I don't want to size as heavy, maybe size down. Possibly enter not as heavy or just watch the market and see what happens. Because as these breaks happen, that's when you want to be more aggressive with your standing of entering a position. I'm trying to get these in sequence. Here we go. So at, like now you guys can kind of see this from like a better perspective. I'm going to switch back to the daily. There's not going to be as many candles, but you'll see it a little bit better. Notice all the chop. Like it doesn't move very much, but when it breaks out of the zones and it shows the strength, that move happens, whether it's the upside or the downside. Using those, okay, we're chopping, we're chopping. Look what we've been doing for the past about week and a half on spot. Slow push up, slow push up, massive red candle pushing back up, pushing back up. Like, where's the direction at this point? Are you going to try and guess it? Are you going to wait and just let the market do its thing? If it breaks on the upside, more than likely, we're going to get a recontest like what's happened back here. Actually, let me get a white highlight. We're going to get that recontest. There's always a better opportunity. If you add time to a contract and you just let it play out, you can afford to hold it no matter what happens. But when you play zero DTE or the week of contracts, you're more than likely putting yourself in a situation of hope over like, oh, the setup is here. It's going to happen any day now. The stock doesn't have to do what it wants just because like you're in a position. You get that egotistic bias of, oh, I'm in calls. It has to go up now. Focus on what the stock and the chart are actually going to do based off volume coming in or volume coming out. As we chop and we break out, the move happens. That's when you want to start playing more aggressive if you want to say it. As you see the momentum, as you see the stuff aligning to what you need, heavy sell-offs, obviously in a bull market, get eaten up by buyers. So as we sell off, don't just enter calls blindly. Use past levels to find those dip buys. Heavy chop historically, once we break to the upside and it pulls back, usually the liquidity grab or the zone grab, whatever you want to call it for your like vocab, those pullbacks get eaten up and it sends right back to the upside. The hedge funds buy these consolidations. They push the price. They sell them at the top to retail. That probably chases. As the price comes down, they just rebuy the position they sold a month or so ago. It's a rinse and repeat for them. We can't control the market, so we have to play along with them and understand why they do what they do. Use historical levels to that advantage. When there's chop, we break out to the upside. Look for those pullbacks. Watch the trends. Watch price action correlation as stuff happens in the moment. Right now, I'm going to say this one more time, we're not doing much. Volume is slowly dying down, but that doesn't mean we're not going to push higher. It also doesn't mean we're just going to drop off because volume is not as heavy. The idea of comprehending until the zone breaks out and shows strength, whether above the hold or it breaks under and it rejects and shows strength on the downside, you're more than likely just messing around trying to like figure something out. So chop days, you can make money. Don't get me wrong. I have nothing against them. I scalp and chop days, but I don't go for like 40% gains. I just try and get a quick 15, 20%. I enter the trade knowing I'm not trying to hit big. So my risk has to be very tight. And my reward, when I'm green, I have to take it. If you have the opportunity to sell for green, you might as well take it on days that are like this with the orange highlight, just these up-down chops. So once the move happens, 
that's when you want to save that capital and take advantage of the momentum, putting yourself in a better position to maybe hold contracts longer, swing runners overnight. The most of the money that you'll make in a bull market or in a bear market should only come from your runners. You should not be holding a whole position just hoping that it keeps going. This is like the big trade. That's why it's always smart to size in with contracts so that as it pushes one way, sell, sell some, leave the runners, stop loss, break even. Because once this chop is over, whether upside or downside, we're going to have a move. And if I zoom out on the daily and show you guys this, focus on where SPY has a rejection coming up. Like we've had two wicks around the 462.5 area. Ahead of that, we had chop at all-time highs. So if we break out to the upside, there's not much holding this back outside of this chop at the highs, which is literally a zone from like 464 to 468. That's literally another $10 to the upside before we hit chop that's going to actually affect us with price action. And if we drop on the downside, that's where the chop's going to hit. And we're currently there. That's why we're chopping so much. Historically, look at all of this chop right here. This zone between the four, 454 to 456, this has always been a hesitant area ever since the previous all-time highs in 2021 going into 2022. So respectfully, we have to understand that. I, I get the idea, like bulls all the way, but realize if we push, we have consolidation coming from a historical zone at the all-time high. So it's very smart to just really understand like what's a chop day. When is it smart for me to size heavy? Maybe I should size down because we're not moving too much. You have to preserve money and not just make the money. Anyone can make money in the market, but not many can keep it and grow that moving forward. Uh, mind showing us your thoughts on SPX or SPY? I don't know if I missed it. Yeah, Mike, was that enough for you? What I just said on SPY, was that pretty good? Overall, with where SPY is, it's chopping, obviously which I hope you guys understand that now. If you've been looking at SPY for like the last week and you're thinking like, why am I not making money on this? You're not supposed to be able to. Usually hedge funds, uh, Wall Street, bank institutionals, they trade and chop it like this because a massive move is coming and they don't want retail to have money to trade when that move hits. They chop it up so that we have to lose because they're not going to lose. They have money to buy short, buy short. When they're throwing in millions if not billions in the shares of companies a one dollar move they're making their money they need people like us we're trying to catch the move so we can't enter stuff and just hope for that breakout or hope that we're going to make money out of it stuff like this we have to be cautious we have to wait we have to take advantage of when this drops to the downside we have to look for a dip by opportunity not just size and heavy oh we're at support i gotta load calls before it's too late feel your way into the position the chop is still in the run, but it's holding at the actual support within the chop zone. If we push up, wait to see if we break above and then hold as a recontest to a now resistance to support flip, that's when you should get calls. And I get the idea, like, what if we break this high and then we just keep going and we never have a pullback? That's the risk. And it sucks. I get it. But don't ever think you're missing money in the market because as long as you're prepared every day, once these chop days or whatever day you're looking at, once these filter out, you're going to be prepared for a move and have capital to make that move in your uh, presence. Make it so that you can actually get in and experience that trade and not just watch it because you're out of money. Maybe you're not confident. That's the hardest part about just being patient and using that to your advantage. And it really helps that the concept I feel to understand for some time now. Yeah, that's good. Do you have an opinion of a move or anything? Um, the biggest thing, and I'm going to end with, if you guys have any questions about what we talked about, uh, type them now. We have about four minutes left before I'm going to stop the recording. So any questions about this topic, type them, and I will get to them very soon. Looking at SPY, the biggest thing that I don't like to do is assume a move based off a news release after hours. Every time we have a news release, which you guys heard about, I think it was for the, the Japan banking or something from the 27th, which was the Thursday sell-off we had at noon, news came out about banking with something. And I, someone here will type it. I don't remember for sure, but I saw the release and everything. That pullback got eaten up. And the very next day, we're almost back to where we were before that news release. So I'm always skeptical with, like, is the news being released to scare us as retail? 
and then the big boys just buy up the dip again. That's why I'm always focused on just zones. If we come back to the 41, uh, 451.5 on SPY, I want to see a volume increases on the buying side. Because looking at just the one hour, look at the volume down here. The volume is slowly diminishing. We're not gaining traction. We're just sitting right now. When volume dies out, a move usually happens. You look at the volume back here. For almost five days, back to back, low volume, and we're barely moving. Yes, we're moving like up, down, up, down, but nothing major. And then once volume kicks in, we have massive move, whether it's overnight, end of the day, intraday sell-off. The volume is the key. Low volume push to the upside isn't going to continue. Trying to comprehend or at least give yourself an edge with volume does help a little bit. It's not always 100% guaranteed to give you that right direction, but no system's 100%. You just need odds in your favor. That's the hardest part about trading because so many people, they want that golden system. The biggest thing is like your mental. Should I be trading? Should I size less? Because if I lose sizing this heavy, it's going to pull me back to my account where I may not be able to recover from it. That's the most important thing that you have to figure out. If they don't do a pullback, I assume you wait for the next consolidation to break. This will definitely take days. Later. Yeah, exactly. I don't expect SPY to break out anytime soon, but also realize we have, I'd say two of the biggest companies in the market, top five, I'd say, Amazon and Apple, releasing earnings on Thursday. Friday is a zero DTE for all week of contracts. So I truly think Friday is going to be like the day for the move. Maybe it could be tomorrow, could be Thursday, but I'm preparing for Apple and Amazon to basically give the market the direction. If they both beat, I don't see why we wouldn't push even higher. But if they both lose on earnings, this run-up that we've had the past few months is slowly going to trickle down to a major support, which I'm looking at that historical double top that when we broke out, we've done nothing but upside since. So if we do have a pullback, I'm looking at like 443 area. And if I switch over to the S, uh, SPX section, using that same zone for the pullback, this loads, come on now. SPX is always tweaking. When SPX pulls back around that same double top that SPY had, I'm focused on that same area for a possible like buy on the dip, which is going to be around this area, which is just under and around that 4460, 4460 area. I'm not saying we're going to have a pullback like that. That's just the preparation that I have in case that scenario unfolds. I'm prepared either way. Are there any... Uh, last minute questions or anything. I see uh, MK, you said thing about PayPal. I'll pull it up after I uh, pause the recording. I feel like you guys may be good. 